tropical fishes exhibit some of the most beautiful colors in the world. Here is the ultimate in design and fascinating form. Here is beauty of motion, perfect grace. Living beauty, beyond the capabilities of created man to emulate. Providing him both with endless pleasure and with forms of life so bizarre as to strain his credibility. Few of those who gaze in fascinated admiration upon these colorful and graceful fishes realize the vital importance of the minute organisms often seen swimming frantically among the tropical beauties. Yet these tiny forms are indeed remarkable among marine animals, and their presence in thousands of aquaria throughout the world, both public and private, is the end result of long and arduous research. These are the brine shrimp, and this is their source. Our story begins in Stein Hart Aquarium, one of the departments of the California Academy of Science, located in San Francisco's famed Golden Gate Park. In this building, more than two million visitors each year see a multitude of exhibits, beginning with the giant alligators in the swamp area, to many of the smaller tanks where the visitor's quizzical gaze is returned in kind by many of the fishes. And of course, each fish has a different eye character. And here to tell us the brine shrimp story is the superintendent and curator of Steinhardt Aquarium, Dr. Earl F. Harold. As every aquarist knows, one of the problems of keeping fishes alive and happy in captivity is to have an adequate diet. Now, in spite of daphnia and other micro and microorganisms, we haven't always had enough living food. So, in 1923, my predecessor at Steinhardt Aquarium, this is the late Alvin Field, became interested in the possibility of using living brine shrimp as a food for fish. Now, he quickly found that uh, such forms as the large Atlantic sand tiger shark was not the slightest interested in the very small brine shrimp. And this was equally true of the so-called bloodthirsty piranha from the Amazon of South America. Nonetheless, the lowly brine shrimp did serve as an effective appetite stimulus for some of the moderate-sized fishes, such as the beautiful Aluha Kihikihi, from the warm, clear blue waters of the Hawaiian Islands. For small freshwater and marine fishes, Alvin Deal found that the brine shrimp was an ideal food. This is well indicated by the feeding activities of the calico goldfish. equally well demonstrated by such amazingly beautiful fishes as the blue damsel from the coral reef of the tropical Indo-Pacific. One of the tests that might be applied to a live fish food is to study how blind cave animals will react to it. Mexican blind cave keratin is well known to aquarists since it breeds readily in captivity and is present in many aquariums over the world. Despite its blindness, the cave fish has little difficulty in locating its food. We find that it thrives on a simple diet of brine shrimp. This is also true of the rare, spindly like it, Texas blind salamander, which seems quite fragile, but actually, Tiflomolki is a rather hardy animal whose longevity in captivity exceeds two years. And in the Congo region of Africa, there's another rare blind cave animal that relishes brine shrimp. The Congo Blind Cave Farm from the Sideville Cave located near Leopoldville. 
Now it feels worth much the beginning of a project later expanded by the San Francisco Aquarium Society. Today, the brain shrimp is valuable in a number of scientific fields. Name two, genetics and bioassay analysis. These graceful creatures belong to that group known as the fairy shrimp. They are phylopod crustaceans. So often hear them referred to by the scientific name Artemia delina. Now, this species occurs through many parts of North America, and there are other kinds of brine shrimp in Africa and in Asia. At the age of three weeks, the brine shrimp is an adult, sexually mature. You may tell the sexes by very simple characteristics. For example, the male has expanded claspers located in this position on the head. Normally, they lie alongside the head. Now, when we look at the female, we find that she is missing these claspers. But instead, under the tail, she has an enlargement, which is the root bulb wherein the eggs are developed. Now, keeping these rather simple characteristics in mind, let's put the living brine shrimp under the microscope and see how they actually appear. Now, this is the male with the claspers located alongside the head. The female lacks these structures. Actually, of course, the male is not very important since the female can reproduce without him. You may lay eggs or give birth to living young. This is dependent upon the amount of salt in the water. In seawater of normal salinity, the female usually gives birth to living young, with the eggs hatching within the brood house before expulsion. With continued evaporation by the sun, the seawater becomes very salty. The eggs are then popped out of the brood pouch, just like so many peas coming out of a pot. As many as 160 may be laid in this fashion, and the hatching now occurs outside of the brood pouch. Hatching occurs in a few hours, and under favorable conditions, the nauplius, or baby brine shrimp, begins its very rapid progress to adulthood. The young nauplii have three pairs of appendages, the first two becoming antenna, the second and larger pair becoming swimming organs, while the third pair becomes the mandible. Body segmentation is rather rapid, and the appendages develop along the thorax until the full quota of 11 pairs is present. The minute organisms swimming around the young seahorse are newly hatched brine shrimp. They have proven to be an excellent food for both newborn and young fishes alike. This is especially true in regard to young seahorses. The nauplii providing food for the seahorse, as well as for other kinds of animals in the area. In this case, the button-like fish louse argument attached to the side of the body. The adult seahorse is one of numerous varieties of tropical marine fishes which must be provided with a living food supply. At Steinhardt Aquarium, the large Florida seahorses have been successfully raised on a constant diet of adult brine shrimp. Now, it's well known that the female seahorse lays her eggs in the brood pouch of the male. This is the male we see here. The eggs are incubated for a number of days in that pouch under the tail. And after this incubation proceeds for the proper length of time, Youngsters are expelled by the violent contraction on the part of the body. From the standpoint of comparative size, the newly born seahorses are about equal to the fully grown adult brine shrimp, both of them average around 5 eighths of an inch in length. Using baby brine shrimp for food, the growth of these young seahorses is fairly rapid. So that in a period of perhaps a month, the young seahorse has now almost tripled its size and has far outstripped the adult brine shrimp in total body length. reached an age of two months, the young seahorse has again grown markedly, and it requires about eight months for the youngster to gain adult size. 
Now, coming back to the brine shrimp, one of the unique characteristics of this animal is the fact that it requires extremely salty water in which to live. Now, the places where they really thrive are in the evaporating ponds of the Solent Salt Company. We have conditions of this kind in the south end of San Francisco Bay, located in this division, in the Luxley Salt Pond. The only way to see this, however, is to do so from there. So let's go to the airport, take a camera, and join the pilot, along with Henry Bordenave and Maury Ratcliffe, for an aerial survey of the Luxley Salt Pond. is caused by the growth of algae. This tells us how long the water has been evaporating. Bright red ponds have been evaporating for five to seven years, and they are approaching completion with the salt nearly ready for harvest. Bright shrimp do not do well in these old ponds, and they prefer the brown ponds, which are three to four years of age. By contrast, new ponds, one to two years of age, are bright green in color. So does the pond that is intermediate in the evaporating process, the brown pond, that provides the ideal salinity for the growth of brine shrimp. Birds are a common sight on the shore around the shrimp pond. They are usually abundant at the edge of the water, because this is the area where during the night millions of brine shrimp accumulate. Brine shrimp will remain near the shore for only a short time after daybreak. So, like most fishing trips, brine shrimp collecting begins early in the morning. Lowered gently into the water, each net on a good day will come up with several pounds of shrimp. And then, of course, the shrimp are transferred to the bucket, after which the seining continues. Because of the high salinity of the water in which the brine shrimp live, they have few natural predators. One exception are the shorebirds. These birds, in particular the habitat, always know when and where to seek out this delicacy. The shorebirds may be considered friends as well as enemies of the brine shrimp. Eggs embedded in mud on their feet or even carried in their digestive tract may be transported for hundreds of miles to a new location where the eggs will subsequently hatch. Scientists have concluded that this explains the seemingly haphazard distribution of brine shrimp throughout the world, even in such unlikely places as the Sahara Desert. Well, let's get back to the shrimpers, because they have to work steadily for in two or three hours after daybreak. The brine shrimp will once more be dispersed throughout the pond. As the men decide to call it a day, their truck will contain not just a few pounds, but possibly a ton and a half of these tiny crustaceans. The shrimp must be transported to the processing plant, where if they are to be frozen, the first step is to wash them with fresh water, so that they become suitable food for fresh water as well as for marine fishes. With all of the salt and the dirt removed, the little shrimp are poured into machines. This hopper then feeds the material down into a measuring device, which allows the proper amount to be fed into the small plastic bags in preparation for freezing. All of this is a very carefully controlled operation. The next thing that happens is that the shrimp come out and go into refrigerated cars and travel to many different parts of this country as well as other parts of the world. 
Here in Mori Rakowitz shows us how the frozen brine trench can be used by the aquarium. Very small amount is broken off. And this is dropped into the tank. If we were to place a camera underneath this tank, watch these guppies coming up for the bits of frozen brine trench. We would find that they react in a typical feeding pattern. My bed was on the brine shrimp. Here they're thawed out, placed into the water. And again, we observe the typical feeding behavior of the guppy. This has been a very quick review of some of the details of the collecting activities pertaining to the adult brine shrimp. Now, through the years, much of this information has appeared in the Aquarium Journal, which is the official monthly publication of the San Francisco Aquarium Society. Now, in these pages, the lowly brine shrimp has shared copy with the mollies, fighting fishes, short tails, and a great variety of others from the freshwaters as well as from the marine environment of the province. Now, in addition to this, the San Francisco Aquarium Society sponsors the publication of technical items as the bibliography and the anatomy of the brine shrimp. Let's move on now to another facet of the brine shrimp story, and this has to do with the brine shrimp egg. An egg which at times may seem to be almost indestructible. If I take this small symbol and fill the symbol with brine shrimp egg, and then place this symbol under the microscope and count those eggs, I would find that there were many, many thousands in this small container. Now the adult brine shrimp, the female, lays these eggs in very, very salty water. In fact, the water is so salty that the eggs will not hatch. And so as a result, the wind picks up these eggs and pushes them to the shoreline. This area where the eggs have accumulated might appear to be simply a puddle of mud on the shore of the pond. To those who know brine shrimp, it might be a rich deposit of brine shrimp eggs. Even though the eggs are so plentiful and seemingly indistinguishable one from the other, the collector wants only the choice deposit which will produce the largest harvest of live shrimp. Now, the way he finds this out is by dropping a sample into a bottle of water. And the heavier or fertile eggs will settle to the bottom of the container. Most of these eggs are sinking. So this is a deposit of brine shrimp, well worth mining. In the normal course of events, these brine shrimp eggs would remain on the shore until a rainstorm returns them to the water from which they came. Temporarily, the rain would reduce the salinity of the surface water, and in that brief period, the eggs would hatch. Without the rain, the eggs would lie on the shore for two or three years, but they would still hatch when proper conditions return. Properly preserved by vacuum packaging, their life may even be longer, eight or ten years. Now, back at the plant, the eggs have to be washed first in fresh water. And by washing them through a fine screen, most of the dirt and the foreign matter is removed. Okay, it's a strange thing show up here. Fish heads, fish bones, all kinds of things. The eggs are being washed down into this vat underneath. The washed eggs then look like this, but they have to be removed immediately because if they're not placed very soon on the drying tables, then all of them will spoil. Now, even with the washing and the drying, there are still bits of sand and pieces of eggshell clinging to the fertile egg. And the grape-like clusters of eggs must be broken up. And so this is accomplished by means of this special device, which the eggs are passed through a fine screen. The rubber balls on the top serve to break up the clusters and to allow the eggs to sift down through into this container beneath. Now, for this preliminary processing, the egg 
eggs are placed in a barrel, collected temporarily. The other processing follows, because from this, we must segregate the heavy eggs and the light eggshells and the debris. So a special blowing device is used for this. The eggs are placed in the hopper in the top, set down through the machine. The powerful blower in the machine blows out the light material, blows away all the debris, the heavy material, the good eggs, sinks to the bottom. And finally, the eggs are vacuum packed and placed in these special containers for shipping to places far across the world. And every blessed of these eggs pour in from every continent. To the world's famed aquariums and to homes in almost every country on earth, the eggs through this vacuum packing procedure are transported safely and inexpensively. Hatching is a simple process. A tray with a divider is filled with either seawater or, if more convenient, with fresh water to which table salt is added. A full tablespoon to a quart of water. Now the brine shrimp eggs are sprinkled on the water. A quarter of a teaspoon of eggs for this setup. The newly hatched brine shrimp or nauseae will swim under the divider and swim away from the undesirable eggshell. So we bring in the light to aid this process because the brine shrimp are photocopic and they swim towards the light. With a temperature around 75 degrees, the eggs begin to hatch within 24 hours. At 60 degrees, the process will take longer but will still be successful. The newly hatched nauplii or baby brine shrimp are easily removed from the water with the diver. Water fish, they must be washed to remove the salt. The baby shrimp then go into the fish tank, and we find that they are excellent food for hungry fishes, small and large alike. Catches its food in an almost identical manner. 
Slow motion photography again makes it possible for us to see the long jaw, typical steel hockey. When His Imperial Highness, Akihito, Crown Prince of Japan, visited Steinhardt Aquarium, one fish he'd never seen before was the freshwater spider from Congo. Although the adults are strictly carnivorous, the young forms are raised easily on brine shrimp. Only 11 species are known of these primitive forms, with their long nostrils and their very strange pectoral fins with the fluttering motion. In the same general area of West Central Africa, the most startling fishes are the elephant nose mormyrus. This one has a long extension of the lower lip, which it uses as a pole to stir up the sand, stir up dead brine shrimp, and then to decrease. The four-eyed fish, Anaplex, from the freshwaters of Central America, is a strange brine shrimp feeder that's known as for its divided eye. The upper portion of the eye is used out of water, and the lower portion is used underwater. In the back of the eye are two entirely separate retinas. Many of the marine invertebrates are indiscriminate plankton feeders, and this is true of the two worms. They are lacking in eyes, and the mucus on the feathery tentacles does most of the work in capturing food, in this case, brine shrimp. One of the picturesque damsels of the tropical reef is the green chromus, whose colors change with the light intensity. And finally, the fish with the longest name in the world, the Homa Homa Nuka Nuka Apua, made immortal by the song of the same name. Actually, it's one of our common trigger fishes of the tropical Indo Pacific.